everyone, welcome again to Pot Luck, your anything and everything talk show here in Northern Virginia. Um, we're back again in the studio once more with Mr. Matt Lake to finish our discussion on local folklore and history. Um, tonight we're going to talk about the Roanoke colony that was lost uh, back in the 1500s. Um, Mr. Lake, uh, author of Weird Maryland, Media Gothic, and many other books, as well as historian, welcome back. Lovely to be here again. Um, so, tell us, I guess, where do we start? Uh, how the colony was founded. It was Walter Riley, right? Uh, yeah, Walter Riley. Uh, 1500s, it was in that great expansion in the, um, in the Elizabethan era where um, they discovered the new world, they discovered potatoes, they discovered tobacco, and they just really wanted to get a foothold in the, uh, in the, uh, the uh, world domination. It was, a, it was a great British tradition. Um, it was, you know, they, they expanded across um, Wales and they expanded into Scotland and bits of Ireland and, uh, the, you know, and then they just thought, oh, let's just keep heading west and see what we find. And uh, the Spaniards got there first and that really irked uh, the, uh, the Brits because we were at war with Spain at the time. And uh, so, yeah, it's like, okay, we're going we're gonna to get a toehold in this colony. And so um, they, they tried a couple of times, we were going to get a toehold in this continent by establishing a colony on this little, um, little island. And it was called Roanoke. I think it's delightful that, um, that, the, that Virginia has adopted the, the, the name of, of, of Roanoke for its own town. It, it strikes me because this Isn't colony in was, the same was place? a different place, yeah. because it was a colossally yeah, well, we can get into the story of, of, uh, of before I start launching forth on the, the, the bold move of naming your town Roanoke after what <laughs> happened to the original Roanoke. <laughs> but, but first we'll say what happened to the original Roanoke. Uh, it was the uh, 1580s. They had a couple of failed attempts to get this, uh, to get this toehold in the colony, mm. uh, toehold in the continent, rather. And then they, uh, the, yeah, on the side, it was the third attempt. They wound up, you know, sort of like, yeah, being able to get enough people over there with just about enough supplies. But, you know, there, there were a lot of false starts that led to uh, there being basically not enough in this colony uh, to, to be able to support it for long. Um, the original governor, a fellow called uh, White, John White, um, uh, he had his, his he brought his wife and you know, there were 120 people in the, in, you know, in the colony, but there weren't enough supplies to, to support to support them throughout the uh, throughout the, uh, the you know to, for long enough to be established. So um, they wound up um, uh, settling for as long as they could, and then the governor, which I think is unusual, the governor said, "I'm just going to pop back to England and get the rest." of the stuff that we need, uh, leaving his wife, his daughter, his newborn grandchild, who was the first person of, of British extraction born in the new world. So this, the, this, it, was, it was a massive deal that, um, uh, that uh, you know, so the, the, the family had established itself as, you know, in this toehold of, 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 of this new continent. And then, Pops says, I'm just going to you know, pop out to the shops for a while and get what we need and uh, sail back. Uh, it's, it's a treacherous journey across the Atlantic. And something, he's only supposed to be gone a year, and it was mm -hmm. three years before he returned. Yeah. There was this little issue that Britain was having with Spain, uh, as I right. might have mentioned at the time. And all the ships in, all the, ships in the fleet uh, were needed for the war with Spain. And... Uh, here's you know, John White, and he's, he's left his family over in the New World, and, and then they go off to, um, yeah, so they're, they're trying to survive as best they can with short supply. And the years go by, and they continue to go by, and John White's you know, attempting to raise the necessary supplies to go back to his family and get them. Uh, and Eventually, as you say, three years later on, uh, he goes back 
and uh, lands on the island and where there had been a not thriving colony, but where there had been a colony of 120 right. people, uh, there was a bunch of stockades and nothing. It was like the Mary Celeste, but, but, but without anything. I mean, you know, the, the, it, was, it was devoid of people. There, were no, um, there was nothing left. So we weren't talking about you know half-eaten meals left, like mm -mm -mm. It, just no. everything gone. Yeah, we yeah we're talking about the you know the stockades were there, and carved into uh, one of the um, uh, one of the posts of the stockade was um, uh, three letters C R O, and uh, carved into another one was uh, the word uh, Croatoan, uh, which was. Um, a variant on one of the local tribes, the Croatan tribe, and um, and that was it. That was the only that was the only remnant, and it was it was uh, it was deserted. And so yeah, here's this guy's left his family, <laughs> gone round yeah, gone round the corner shop to get a, yeah to get yeah milk and bread, and then come back three years later to discover that they've all gone. Well, it's sort of unsurprising. As I, as I think about what it must have been like for the colonists who were left behind, and then, you know, one calendar year goes by, you know, a second one goes by, you start to think that Dad's not coming back again, you know, <laughs> he's done a bunk. Yeah, but it's not like they had, you know, someplace else to go. It's like, well, let's just go up the road what? to New York. <laughs> <laughs> well, they, yeah, they, they, they didn't have anywhere to go in the sense of, uh, of um, there was there wasn't another colony that they could go to down the road. This was this was yeah prior to the 1600s. The place was not settled by Europeans. This part of the this part of the continent wasn't settled by Europeans at the time. So yeah, they didn't there weren't any Europeans. But you're fall, you're falling victim to the classic blunder of assuming that just because there weren't any white folk around that there weren't well, any people around. So <laughs> but there weren't any resorts or, or you know, obvious places true. that are obviously better than where we are. Yeah, and in fact, one of the abortive attempts that they had made uh, to to um, to establish a uh, colony here or there um, was. Um, it didn't end with great relationships with the indigenous peoples. It was one of these things. There was, the, yeah, there, there were there were tales, and this was prior to the, the settling by uh, John White's family uh, and the 120 odd other right. people. Um, there had been some issues. There had been some issues of, um, you know. Like you know, the silver chalice goes missing, and uh, and they go around blaming the neighbours for stealing it. That kind of stuff. So like, what would be a, a petty domestic dispute amongst you know in a neighbourhood became you know sort of like in yeah it was it was it was like yeah a race war essentially. It was it was two different two radically different cultures and a real misunderstanding of what was going on. So and it was it was there was some ugliness. Do we have much of a record as far as uh, uh, their relationships with the indigenous tribes? Uh, not huge. No, um, there were there were records of yeah they were, they, they were very suspicious of of the um, the um, the people that they found here, which in in Elizabethan. English sense, make, it makes a lot of sense. Um, the Elizabethan era was a very paranoid era. Um, Elizabeth's. I mean, we're talking, to put it into context, we're talking the same time period as Shakespeare, correct? Sure, absolutely. Yeah. And uh, there is, it was, it, to, yeah, in, in terms of like, you know, uh, uh, power structures and government structures, uh, succession was a real problem. At that time, it wasn't. It, there wasn't an, an, an orderly uh, right. transfer of authority. It wasn't. It wasn't like an election year, which yeah, they come around every four years and and you know sort of to a greater or lesser extent as a peaceful I'm not, I'm transfer. Not sure, I'm, I'm not sure power. orderly is the best way to describe <laughs> a process these days, but may I get your point? Mm -hmm. So, so uh, at that time, um, the success the succession to the throne was uh, was fraught because I mean of course we're talking about the Elizabethan era anyone who knows about you know sort of Elizabeth's dad knows that yeah he wound up 
like going through wives and having them executed because they weren't providing him with a male heir. And that's the level of, you know, of nastiness that essentially surrounded the, the succession of power mm -hmm. in, in England at the time. Um, Elizabeth, um, as all royalty, yeah, royalty's essentially got to marry royalty. And if you've got a woman, um, then the way culture was at the time, you know, sort of, she marries a royal male, you know, the, the, you know her, her chattel is, you know, is his chattel at that point. And so she did not marry. It, was, it really was a question of she became, you know, sort of like this, this um, uh, you know, sort of she became the central focus. And succession was, was, was a problem. Also, a lot of Europe and the part, part of the war with Spain was about this business of succession. Um, King of Spain kind of wanted to marry Elizabeth because that way he could have England. Um, the, you know, we get into denominational uh, religious issues here as well because you know, she was the head of the Protestant you know, Church of England and like all the other royalty around were Catholics and consequently it was, you know, so this, this was a, a, you know, a, a diminution of the power. For her to marry you know, into royalty somewhere else in, in Europe would, would have led to a diminution of her power and her control over Britain and it, it didn't work with her being the head of the church. Getting really deep into this, but it was a paranoid time, long and short of it. She had a network of spies to prevent, you know, sort of uh, cultural, you know, uh, wars in England. Uh, she, this was a real kind of a police state kind of a thing. There was a really famous painting of um, of Elizabeth with this with these weird appliques on her on her dress. There's eyes and ears that are all over this pattern on this amazing dress that she's wearing. And that was as a sign that, yeah, she has eyes and ears everywhere. And you were talking about Shakespeare early on. His, like, the superstar that was, that, that, that broke the whole, yeah, stage at the, uh, yeah, in that era, a little bit before him was Christopher Marlowe. Right. Wrote, you know, Duchess of Malfi and a bunch of other plays. He was the, he was the, he was the, he was the he was the hot stuff before Shakespeare came along. Uh, there is very very strong evidence that he was part of the spy network that uh, that Elizabeth had. So yeah, she, he was he was he was a, 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 he was part of this you know like, like group that kept eyes and ears open uh, for any possible, you know, sort of infiltration. That, that turned up as a plot in a science fiction novel that I read. I thought it was all fiction. No, no. <laughs> he was, well, he was, Christopher Marlowe, we, we're getting way off topic here, but I just can't help it. Christopher Marlowe was, he was uh, the son of a cobbler. He was, he was a, he was a, he was a, he was a low tradesman, but they, they had money. And there's a system of education that's, that, that was going on in England called grammar schools. Uh, th that wasn't like a you know, like an elementary school, like grammar school means in this country. Grammar schools, you had to pass an exam at the age of 11, and they took you through 18, and it was for the sons of tradesmen, so that they could be of use to the uh, 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 of use to the to the uh, to the empire. Right. Um, and so Christopher Marlowe was a really really bright man, uh, uh, son of a tradesman who who was not only well versed in um, in poetry, which he was extremely good at, and, and uh, drama, you know, dramaturgy, uh, but was also you know, like a, a code. He, he he knew codes, and uh, he was also you know he was he wasn't a very discreet man, as you know. He he, uh, yes. he, he wound up getting he wound up getting stabbed in a, in what might have been a bar brawl or might actually have been an assassination because he was too loose-lipped for the spy network. Right. So that is the, uh, that, that's the background of how you know, Brit British people were about their neighbors. So it, they really did not get on with the you know, local colonists because they were trained not to trust anyone that wasn't one of them. It was really part of the, part of the, fa okay. the fabric of the place. And Walter Riley had a, uh, 
an impetuous behind all this. I mean, it was, it was Riley's project to mm -hmm. form this colony, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. What and once again, this was this was for the expansion of the empire. But he never set, actually set foot over here. No, he didn't have to. He yeah, he had people to do that. He was the, he was the mastermind. It was a nasty trip over. I mean, he he sailed to do the, you know, Sir Walter did, but you know, uh, and he had explored the place. But what was most important for him was to solidify his place in court. So he had he had worthy you know sort of. Um, uh, 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 deputies to do to do his work for him, and uh, John White was one of these worthy deputies. Brilliant man. He was an, he was an artist. He was a marvelous cartographer. Um, not so good about you know sort of uh, handling you know, losses of goods and chattel at sea, and that's why they came to the uh, to the to the uh, to the island, ill-equipped to, to probably not the best settlement. father or husband either. <laughs> Well, a pretty poor governor, really. You, 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 you get a toehold in a place, and then I would say the smart money for a good governor would be to stay there and send someone else back to get the st <laughs> to get the supplies. But that wasn't his approach. Um, and from the point of view of the colonists, I got to say it, it must be that uh, that they reached a point where. You know, Daddy's not coming back. You know, he, you know, he could have been back in you know two months with all the supplies that they needed. So up to twelve, up to twelve months if you really had to raise a lot of funds to do it. But you know, two years are gone. You go into three years, and and you know, it's so you is, get the impression Dad's not coming. What's back. the most likely um, supposition here that they they kind of dispersed into the indigenous population in some way, or that they were killed, or? There are, there's a number of different um, uh, possibilities that have been touted. I mean, I'll, I'll go through them in a not particularly, you know, sort of uh, scientific or orderly fashion. Uh, one is that with the history of uh, colonization and poor relationships with the neighbors, that they essentially ticked off their neighbors and got slaughtered. Um, that's a, a strong possibility given the nature of the suspicion between mm -hmm. um, uh, nations uh, that was prevalent in Europe at the time. So you, you go in there expecting that your neighbor's going to stab you in the back. You start getting, you, you st it, it's a self fulfilling prophecy. Right. You're not going to get good neighborly relations if you assume your neighbor is going is to do you in. Um, and uh, there had been some some bad blood uh, between you know in the early attempts to establish the colony. So it's it's reasonable to assume that there, that there might have been some um, uh, slaughter. Right. Uh, no evidence of that though. It wasn't as if the the you know, the uh, the uh, settlement had been burned to the ground and that there were you know there were you know bones that had been shattered by by um, uh, weaponry anywhere around. And then there's this clue. Uh, it was it was written in you know sort of in in Roman script, and it was you know sort of Croatoan, which has figured big in pop culture and horror novels and comic <laughs> books over the years. And nobody's ever been into right. Well, it's it it, it, it is very close to um, uh, it's an alternate name for one of the tribes. The, the Croatoan is how um, I've I've seen it written. Okay. Uh, but when we're talking about between between nations, Croatoan Croatoan might be it could be either now. Is is that the um, is that the writing on the wall? Is that the is that the racha uh, on the wall uh, where the dying people are writing? Yeah, the Croatan did it, uh, uh, or is it um, or is it a question of you know sort of you know, that, that's a reasonable supposition, particularly since in, in one case there was C R O and then nothing, so it was almost it was it was, it was written a second time. We could just run out of room on the pole. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, well, after three years, I mean, yeah. So it's, there's a strong possibility if they'd have nailed a um, uh, a, uh, a yeah, an explanation of what was going on to the post, it could quite easily have like blown away or been you know blown away in a storm or whatever. Um, the only you know, re, you know piece of evidence that remained was the stuff that was in stockade posts that were rammed into the ground, good and steady. Yeah. Um, so the poss one possibility is that they were, uh, is that they were massacred. Uh, no evidence really to support that. Um, there are more supernatural explanations of what might have happened. There is the, the, the famous like Wendigo 
uh, or Muhe, uh, which are two like spirits that occupy people uh, and transform them into like cannibal monsters. So you know, in when they go is kind of a cross between a werewolf and Bigfoot, sort of. Uh, a little bit of yeti thrown in. Physically, yeah, yeah, he's got that. He's got that kind of like yeti, big man, you know, big hairy hominid kind of a, a, a vibe to him. But uh, in the culture, he's far more of a. There's a supernatural creature. There's a transformation involved, okay. and they are essentially humans that are possessed of this spirit that become monsters. And who uh, the Mahue is a, is another uh, example of this kind of a, a spirit. Different tribes call them different things, but essentially it is uh, a, a, a transformed human who eats other humans. So the, the, the whole Donner Party uh, explanation is another one that, you know, so they, they ran out of supplies. And, and, and slowly, you know, they just, they just ate their way but, through themselves. But like the massacre, you'd think there would be evidence left behind exactly. if that were the case. And there is, and there, is there, there, there was none, realistically. Um, the um, some of the more fringe explanations, are, you know, fascinating. There was one that that, uh, that there was a there was some kind of a secret mission involved. The whole thing was uh, some kind of a secret mission, and that when he came back, he the colony wasn't lost at all. They were out fulfilling the mission, whatever the mission was. And in these in these wild, you know, sort of like you know, uh, paranoid spy ridden times, the possibility of a secret mission. Is yeah, it, it, it had some traction. So there was there were there were the. the but this is a much more yeah fabulist approach. Right. It's, it's, it's far more sensational and unrealistic. Um, another explanation, and the one that really sort of makes sense is that they is that they the, is that they did they 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 dispersed uh, because they couldn't uh, uh, they couldn't support themselves. Uh, that they fell in with. Um, uh, local tribes and say, look, can we pull resources here and just yeah, uh, and get through? And that they became assimilated into tribes um, locally. Uh, that there has been, and quite recently, within the past ten years, there have been um, archaeological finds, not in the the uh, the colony itself, but in the surrounding areas, where there are definitely European artifacts. Uh, uh, discovered in um, native settlements, you know, or you know, native villages, or, or whatever. So mixed in with the um, the indigenous cultural artifacts are like p pots and tools and what have you that are a definitely of European extraction. And and you know, sort of in terms of where they sit in the the geological right. strata, are clearly you know, contemporary. So these these uh, items were. Uh, used at the same time in the same place, and uh, that could have been a subject. That it could have been because of a raid, um, where they, you know, they they trash picked what was left of the colony and and then just distributed it amongst the amongst the indigenous people, or that you know the people and the artifacts came together at the same time. Another fairly compelling um, uh, piece of um, uh, evidence, historical evidence that the um, that that's what happened, that they became assimilated, is that there are there was at least at some point a uh, talk of a uh, of um, uh, some Native American tribes with um, uh, with grey eyes, which is not you know sort of uh, anthropologically that's 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 not a feature uh, in uh, in any of the the native cultures. And the grey might have been blue, or it might have been some uh, some combination. But the, the, it, it seems like a fairly strong indicator that in the uh, genetic mix, there was now um, some uh, some European cultural you know, sort of uh, DNA. So and the so the least interesting, most mundane explanation is probably the real one here. Yeah, it is. It is. People do love the fabulous, though. Yeah. Um, and yeah, the notion of uh, the notion of there being, you know, sort of like they all vanished. There were great cultural explanations that they be that they became, you know, uh, one with uh, uh, animals or the the trees in the area. There's that mystical stuff. Um, 
that, that, those stories sound great, but yeah, realistically speaking, and there's, so there's some strong evidence really that, 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 that they just became part of the culture. It's going to be impossible at this point, absolutely impossible to, uh, to, to prove because you know, so we, we, we don't have access to um, you know, sort of the, the DNA of the tribes from the, from the 15 and 1600s. If we did, then we, you know, we might be able to prove it. But Maybe we'll get a time machine at some point. I Drop think back. so. I think that's <laughs> <laughs> So, now I had always just assumed that it was in the same location. You're saying that they decided to name a town Roanoke someplace else yes. after the lost colony. Yeah. Which is, why, why would you do that? <laughs> <laughs> it's like naming your boat the Titanic. It's exactly what I was thinking. If you if if you're going to create a if you're going to if you're going to create a a, a town and you name it after you know, a, a, you know a, the site of some colossal disaster, it, it shows some grit and determination. It reflects really well on the state of Pennsylvania, uh, state of, uh, of Virginia, is what I would have to say, because. Um, it takes it takes guts to name your airship Hindenburg. It takes guts <laughs> to, name, to, to name your your boat Titanic, and it takes guts to name your town Roanoke. <laughs> Amazing story. Yeah, but you were talking about the the, the, the cultural impact of the Croat Iron. I'd heard, and I don't know how true this is, that it was among the things that um, that uh, Edgar Allan Poe said while he was raving and and uh, and and dying in Baltimore. I think I've heard that, and it features very prominently in uh, a uh, book by Dean Kuntz called Phantoms. The whole, the whole thing actually centers around an ancient evil that was caused that disappearance and several other mass disappearances over history. Now, it's one of the, one of the uh, best books Kuntz ever wrote, um, okay. although the film adaption was uh, not quite so good. Uh, as often happens with films. I had also heard that Ambrose Bierce, who famously, you know, sort of, uh, uh, you know, went went on a, uh, on a visit and was never heard from again, had carved that croton on his bedpost. Fascinating, Matt. That's all we got time for again. What? We have we, we have gone through our time started. again. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, once again, tell folks where they can find your books. Uh, you can get them at uh, at fine bookstores. Uh, and also uh, at uh, uh, bookstore.org, which is a, a, a terrific small book site, uh, bookstore uh, site, and 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 the great and Leviathan the, that sends the, the bigger exactly bigger yeah. internet the, the uh, one bookstore. that sends the ones that sends people S- into space. The, exactly. that, that company is. Well. Um, <laughs> thanks for stopping by. We will be back uh, in a couple of short weeks with uh, fascinating uh, stories to tell you. In the meantime, be safe out there.